want to talk with you about power and weakness. 2 Corinthians 12 and verse 1. Paul says, I must go on boasting, although there's nothing to be gained. I will go on to visions and revelations from the Lord. I know a man in Christ. Now, Paul is talking about himself, but he's talking in the third person. I'll, I'll explain to you why in a little bit. I know a man in Christ who 14 years ago was caught up to the third heaven. Whether it was in the body or out of the body, I do not know. God knows. And I know that this man, whether in the body or apart from the body, I do not know, God knows, was caught up to paradise and heard inexpressible things, things that no one is permitted to tell. I will boast about a man like that, but I will not boast about myself except about my weaknesses. Even if I should choose to boast, I would not be a fool because I would be speaking the truth. But I refrain so that no one will think more of me than is warranted by what I do or say or because of the surpassingly great revelations. Therefore, in order to keep me from becoming conceited, I was given a thorn in my flesh, a messenger of Satan to torment me. Three times I pleaded with the Lord to take it away from me, but he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you for my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly about my weaknesses so that Christ's power may rest on me. That is why, for Christ's sake, I delight in weaknesses, insults, hardships, persecutions, difficulties. For when I am weak, then I am strong. Let's pray and let's invite the Holy Spirit to minister to us. Father, thank you for this morning. Father, thank you for the people that you love so much. Father, thank you for your love here. Thank you for your powerful presence. I pray we would encounter you through the ministry of your word. If your heart agrees with that, would you say amen, amen. and amen. Beloved, I have a word of hope and a word of encouragement from the Lord today. The last time we were together, we started looking at Paul's fool's speech that begins in 2 Corinthians chapter 11, where Paul started to boast about his many sufferings for the sake of Christ. Today, I want to look at the conclusion of the fool's speech, which climaxes in the key verse for the entire letter of 2 Corinthians. He has said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Earlier, Paul told the Corinthians that the gospel is the testimony about God. As I look at 2 Corinthians 12, I find three truths that Paul reveals about God here. And I want to share them with you quickly this morning. Now, I'm lying because I have an eight-course meal for you. And you're going to get all eight courses this morning, all right? Jesus is going to help us. We're going to get translated in time. And the clock is going to somehow I'm going to end this service in time for the next one because a miracle is going to happen. But you're going to get all eight courses. So I want you to just prepare yourself, all right? Three truths about God in 2 Corinthians 12. The first truth is this. God initiates personal supernatural encounters with us. If the gospel is the testimony about God, one of the most fundamental truths that it communicates is that God reveals himself to us. In fact, God must reveal himself to, of, to us, otherwise we could never know him or discover him on our own. God reveals himself to us in his creation. The heavens declare the glory of God. The things that he has made point to his invisible qualities. Isn't it amazing how even in our sophisticated 21st century world with all of our technology, people will still pull their cars over when there's a rainbow in the sky and gawk at it and take pictures. God has revealed himself by acting in human history. In fact, history is his story. He's revealed himself in the lives of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and in the history of the Jewish people. He has revealed himself through the Jewish prophets. The Bible is the written record of God's self-revelations in history. 
penned by human authors under the strict supervision of the Holy Spirit and God reveals himself to us through his word, through the Bible. But God's ultimate revelation of himself to us is in Jesus. To see Jesus is to see God the Father. You might say it this way, Jesus is God's selfie. Hebrews says, in the past, God spoke to our forefathers through the prophets at many times and in many different ways, but in these last days, he has spoken to us by his son, who is the exact representation of his being. God's ultimate revelation of himself is the cross of Jesus Christ. On the cross, God's justice and his mercy met together. On the cross, God sacrificed himself to satisfy himself so that thereby he could open the way for us to be reconciled to him. The cross is the defining moment in human history. Each one of us who is born again here today has received God's self-revelation and we have personally responded to it by believing it. In a moment of divine grace, God caused his light to shine into our darkened hearts and as we listen to the story of Jesus, his voice called out to someplace deep inside of us and he gave us the faith to respond to him and we came alive in him. Now, once we are in Christ, God's revelations continue to us on a more personal level. Paul says that this encounter happened to him because he was in Christ. And when we are in Christ, God continues speaking to us in a more personal way. He speaks to us through the Bible, his word. He speaks to us through the still small voice of the Holy Spirit inside of us. He speaks to us through the gifts of the Holy Spirit administered through fellow believers and through leaders. And God speaks to us personally through supernatural encounters. Let's talk about visions and revelations. Revelations are supernatural encounters during which God discloses spiritual realities to us that we could not know otherwise. Revelations can come through angels. They can come through dreams. They can come through a heavenly voice or heavenly music. Visions are a type of revelation whereby we see spiritual objects or spiritual scenes. All visions are revelations, but not all revelations come to us in the form of a vision. Looking at Paul's words here, I see a few truths about spiritual encounters. First of all, God initiates spiritual encounters. Paul says that he was caught up by God into an encounter. Paul had nothing to do with it except to go along for the ride. We can't just wake up one morning and decide, I think today I'm going to have a spiritual encounter. God decides if and when we'll have one. We can't conjure up a spiritual encounter at will, and we must never try. I would even say that we shouldn't really pray for spiritual encounters because Jesus is the object of our spiritual pursuit, not mystical experiences. But we should expect encounters as people who are already in possession of eternal life and who are citizens of heaven. And we can increase the likelihood of spiritual encounters by regularly investing in personal worship and praying in the spirit. Cornelius was engaged in prayer during his regular daily prayer time when he had a spiritual encounter with an angel. Peter was engaged in a lengthy prayer meeting on a rooftop when he had an encounter in the form of a vision. John was worshiping in the spirit on a Sunday morning when he had a spiritual encounter that is written for us in the book of Revelation. Spiritual encounters cause us to lose our sense of time and space momentarily. They overwhelm our thoughts. They overwhelm our emotions, our five senses. We temporarily lose a sense of ourselves and our surroundings. Paul says, I couldn't tell whether I was in my body or out of it. And frankly, I didn't care at the moment. 
Spiritual encounters are to build us up personally, not to build up our public reputation. In talking about his extraordinary encounter, Paul refers to himself in the third person. The reason being that this was an experience that Paul never intended to share with anyone, and so he was uncomfortable talking about it. The bragging of the false apostles in Corinth pushed Paul into talking about his encounter, but he only does so to set up the occasion to make his crowning boast the ongoing suffering caused by a thorn in his flesh. Paul's encounter wasn't for anyone else but Paul. It wasn't to boost his ministry reputation. It wasn't to boost his book sales or his conference registrations. It was to boost his own spirit. Spiritual encounters encourage us in seasons when nothing good is happening and when nothing is going right. Last time, we talked about Paul's 10 years of silence while he was sewing tents in Tarsus. Nothing much was happening in his ministry. He was preaching the gospel with no significant results. It didn't appear that Paul would ever amount to anything. He tells the Galatians during that time, I was an unknown. When Barnabas set out searching for him, he had to go on a manhunt. No one knew who Paul was. No one knew where Paul was, and nobody cared. In fact, we saw that during these 10 years, Paul endured the worst of the suffering that he enumerates in 2 Corinthians 11. Five times I was whipped by the Jews, 39 lashes minus one. Three times I was beaten with rods. And it was during this time when nothing good was happening, when nothing was going right, that God initiated this encounter for Paul. Isn't it awesome? that God visits us in the worst moments of our life? Isn't it awesome that he lets us know that we're not forgotten by him, that he hasn't changed his mind about us? Isn't it awesome that he reassures us that we didn't misunderstand his call at the beginning, that we haven't missed out on his great plan for us? That's what spiritual encounters do. Spiritual encounters deposit faith in us to endure the earthly journey ahead. Beloved, spiritual encounters are custom. We shouldn't seek to duplicate anyone else's experience. God shows us what he wants us to know for his own purposes. The false apostles had been bragging about their visions and revelations, so Paul discloses one of his that surpasses them all. God captured Paul away and gave him a glimpse of the glories that await us all in heaven. Paul says he was taken to the third heaven, to paradise. In Jewish belief, there were three layers to heaven. The first layer of heaven is the earth's atmosphere, where birds fly and where clouds float by. The second layer is outer space where the stars and the heavenly bodies continuously give glory to God. The third heaven is the invisible realm where God dwells. The Jews called it the highest of heavens and also paradise. This is the place that Jesus promised he would meet the dying thief on the cross on the same day in which they both died. This is the place to which we who are believers in Christ will go immediately when we die. And this is the place that God showed Paul. What Paul saw there is beyond his ability to put into words and beyond his permission to share. But God gave this encounter to Paul to fill him with faith and hope to endure what was yet to come shared last week how amazing it is the length of Paul's list of sufferings. After the first 39 lashes, he went back for 39 more and 39 more and 39 more. After the first Roman beating, he went back for another and another. After the first shipwreck, he went back for another and another. How was Paul able to endure so much? It's because he had a glimpse of the glories of heaven. Paul saw heaven. 
That's why he could write to us, I consider that our present sufferings are not worth comparing with the glory that will be revealed in us. Paul saw heaven. That's why he could write, for me to live is Christ and to die is gain. I desire to depart and go to be with Christ because it is far better there. Paul saw heaven. That's why he could write, Therefore, we do not lose heart, though outwardly our bodies are wasting away, for our light and momentary troubles are, not, are achieving for us an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. Paul saw heaven. That's why he could write, now we know if this earthly tent in which we live is destroyed, we have a building from God, an eternal house in heaven. Paul saw heaven. That's why he could write, we must all stand before the judgment seat of Christ, that each one may receive what is due him for the things done while in the body, whether good or bad. After Paul's spiritual encounter, earthly troubles paled in comparison to the glories he saw awaiting us. And after Paul's encounter, he was no longer afraid of what the Jews could do to him or what the Romans could do to him, nor what the devil or the demons in hell could do to him. The awesome fear of the Lord replaced every earthly fear. That's what personal encounters do. They reassure us that God is with us. They reassure us that whatever it costs to follow Jesus, it is well worth it. They give us a taste of heaven that makes earthly things pale in comparison. May God grant to us all more encounters that fill us with faith and hope for what is yet ahead. Three truths about God. In 2 Corinthians 12, God initiates personal encounters with us. Now, that's the first three courses. Here come the next four. And second truth, God knows best, and he is in complete control. We've talked about heavenly visions. Now let's talk about demonic thorns. Paul reluctantly discloses his encounter only for the sake of setting the stage for what was his greatest struggle in life. I have to tell you the truth. Paul's words here, they're troubling. They they mess with our theology. God gave Paul a surpassing revelation in order to prepare Paul for his ministry, but as a result of those encounters, God allowed a demon to inflict some kind of torment on Paul in order to keep Paul humble. As Pastor Tyler says, oh my goodness. First, these verses tell us about the evil purpose and the limited power of Satan. Beloved, Satan's purpose is to torment us. His purpose is to beat us. The word Paul uses here means to punch in the head over and over again. Satan's purpose is to cause us pain. His purpose is to rob us of all of our strength. His purpose is to humiliate us. His purpose, listen America, is to distract us from loving Jesus and to prevent us from ministering in Jesus' name. And yet these verses also tell us that Satan's power is limited by God. Can I tell you that implicitly these verses say something wonderful about the incredible protection of God around us. Satan is hot to destroy us, but he cannot do whatever he wants to us. God is standing in his way. While we're talking about thorns, do you know the Bible says that God himself is a hedge of thorns around us? The picture is taken from ancient times when shepherds would make a corral in the open wilderness by planting a circle of thorny bushes. And at night they would uh, send all the sheep into the corral and they would guard the entrance with their own bodies. This is the picture that is captured in the Jewish blessing. The Lord bless thee and keep thee. That word keep is derived from shamar, a hedge of thorns. 
Given Satan's ferocious appetite for our destruction, it shouldn't amaze us that Paul had a thorn. It should amaze us that he had only one. Can I tell you, beloved, we really have no idea how much God protects us. We really have no idea how much he holds back the constant onslaught of hell against us. Every moment of every day, Satan is lusting to punch us in the head. He's lusting to torment and harass us. He's lusting to inflict pain, to steal our strength. He's lusting to steal and kill and destroy. But God said, you keep your filthy hands off of him. Jesus said, even the least believer in the kingdom even the most wobbly believer, even the most up and down believer has a guardian angel whose face is always watching God for instructions on how to defend and protect that believer. Now that ought to make you speak in tongues right there. <laughs> Satan and his demons have no power over us except what is permitted by God. Nevertheless, what troubles us about Paul's words here is the statement that God allowed Satan to send a demonic messenger to relentlessly torment Paul. The thorn in the flesh has been a hot topic of speculation for almost 2,000 years. Many have speculated that Paul battled with a recurring physical illness. Some have suggested malaria. Some have suggested migraine headaches. Some have suggested an unsightly eye disease that was common in the ancient world that causes the eyes to continuously ooze and crust over uh, and an unsightly crust. And Paul talks about an unsightly eye condition that he had in his letter to the Galatians. A physical illness would certainly explain why Dr. Luke always traveled with Paul. Others have speculated that Paul battled some kind of mental or emotional problems, perhaps anxiety. Paul talks about anxiety often. You know, having rocks thrown at your head and then being left for dead, it might mess with your head just a little bit, right? <laughs> Others have speculated that Paul wrestled with carnal appetites and temptations. Some have suggested that Paul's thorn was his wife. I'll leave that right there. Still others have made a compelling case that his thorn was the constant persecution that he endured incited by Satan. Truth is, we really cannot say what was Paul's thorn, and I believe that is by divine design. Because each one of us sees in Paul's thorn our own pain and struggles. And I believe God wanted it just that way. When I'm in pain, I hear God's voice. My grace is sufficient for you. When I'm riddled with anxiety, when I think I might not hold it together, I hear God's voice. My grace is sufficient for you. When I'm being persecuted for Jesus' sake, I hear God's voice. My grace is sufficient for you. Look at what these verses say about God's good purpose and his unlimited power. Beloved, Paul's thorn in the flesh, listen, grasp this with your spirit. Paul's thorn in the flesh tells us that there is something more important to God than our immediate comfort. There's something more important to God than that we enjoy a stress-free, problem-free, pain-free life on earth. God has a higher purpose for us and he will use anything he deems necessary to achieve it. What is God's purpose? God's purpose is our glory in him. God's purpose is to show us his glory and to share with us his own glory. On the night that Jesus was betrayed, he interceded for us. He said, Father, I want those whom you have given me to be with me where I am and to see my glory, the glory that you've given me. You see, to behold God's glory is to be entirely and eternally transformed. 
John said there's a moment coming at the end of this age when we will receive a revelation of Christ that no other created being has ever seen. And when we see it, we will be transformed into something that has never before been seen in the entire universe. Beloved, it has not yet appeared what we shall become. But when he appears, we shall become like him for we shall see him as he is in heaven God is going to share a portion of his own glory with us and during Paul's encounter God gave Paul a glimpse of that that's why he wrote Christ in you is the hope of glory that's why he said in Christ we are destined for glory that's why he said although our earthly bodies are buried in dishonor they will be raised in glory he said when Christ appears we will appear with him in glory in a way that I really cannot explain to you earthly suffering for the sake of Christ prepares us to share his glory it qualifies us to share his glory. Paul said, indeed, we share in his sufferings in order that we might also share in his glory. Peter said for a little while, you've had to suffer grief and all kinds of trials, but these have come so that your faith may be authenticated, resulting in your glory when Jesus comes. He said, if you're insulted because of the name of Christ, rejoice, you're blessed, for the spirit of glory rests on you. He said, when the chief shepherd appears, you will receive the crown of glory that will never fade away. God has a purpose in allowing Satan to inflict pain on us. It is to prepare us for God's glory. What's God's purpose? This is good preaching here, by the way. I don't know what's going to happen with you, but I can tell you I'm going home happy today. What's God's purpose? God's purpose is our intimacy with Jesus. And that comes in part through suffering. Beloved, listen to me. Look, everybody look at me. Suffering, our suffering, it creates a bonding experience with Jesus. It's a means by which we identify with him. It's notable that when Paul prayed for deliverance from his thorn, he directed his prayer specifically to Jesus. Paul's prayers were typically directed to the Father in the name of Jesus, but when it came to the thorn, Paul pleaded with the one who identified with our human suffering. Paul's pleading in prayer three times recalls Jesus pleading with the Father three times in the garden. Now, I want you to understand this. Listen, it's so important. Paul was not a masochist. Paul did not have a martyr complex Paul was not an ascetic. He was not fatalistic. Paul did not seek suffering. He did not enjoy suffering, nor did he resign himself to suffering. When suffering came his way, Paul prayed for deliverance. He prayed earnestly. He prayed repeatedly. He prayed specifically. He prayed strategically to Jesus, the one who suffered bodily himself. Paul prayed expectantly. He expected that Jesus would remove the thorn. And when suffering comes our way, we should pray for deliverance too. James said, is anyone in trouble? He should pray. Is anyone sick? He should pray. Pray earnestly. Pray repeatedly. Pray specifically. Pray strategically. Pray expectantly. Paul prayed. But just as the Father lovingly said no to Jesus in the garden, Jesus lovingly said no to Paul. Instead, he made a promise. But he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you. Beloved, listen to me. Catch, catch this, catch this. The same grace that the Father ministered to Jesus in the garden, Jesus now ministered to Paul. The same grace that enabled Jesus to endure the abandonment and betrayal 
by his own, the same grace that enabled him to endure the mock trial and the beatings and the whippings, the same grace that enabled Jesus to endure the cross. Can I tell you that nails did not hold Jesus on the cross? They could not have love held Jesus on the cross. And that same grace that enabled Jesus was now enabling Paul. The same grace the Father gave to Jesus, Jesus now gave to Paul and enabled Paul to keep going. It enabled Paul to keep on loving. It enabled Paul to keep on ministering for him. Beloved, I realized something studying these verses. I have to tell you, I always thought, how great is it? That when we suffer, we have a high priest who identifies with us. He's touched with the feelings of our infirmity. He was tempted in every way, just as we are, yet without sin. When we suffer, I've always thought how wonderful it is that we have a high priest who identifies with us. But there's something deeper. There's something higher. There's something better in these verses. When we suffer, we identify with him. When we suffer and we receive his grace to endure it, we are reliving the experience of Jesus and that deepens our bond with him. It deepens our understanding of him. It deepens our appreciation and our love for him. That's good preaching right there. What's God's purpose? God's purpose is our usefulness and that requires humility. Satan's purpose is to make us useless. But listen, God takes the very thing that Satan dispatched against us and God uses that thing to make us useful. Satan works to make us feel and appear weak, but weak is precisely what God wants. Satan works to humiliate us, but humble is precisely what God can use. God can't do anything with proud people. God is repulsed by human pride. He resists the proud, but he gives more grace to the humble. What's God's purpose? God's purpose is Jesus' glory on earth through us. And that is highlighted best by our weakness. Paul prayed earnestly. He prayed repeatedly, specifically, strategically, expectantly for God to remove the thorn. But God said, Paul, my grace, it's enough for you. For my strength is made perfect in your weakness. The weaker that we are, the more vividly Christ's power shines through us. So a few weeks ago, we replaced our old digital projectors with these new LED screens. Do you like the new screens? I'm liking the new screens. You know, the projectors, they were capable of beaming all the same beautiful images. Those projectors, they were capable of beaming every color of the rainbow But if you recall, the images weren't very clear because there was too much competition from all the natural light in this room. And you know, the same thing is true of us. God wants to project to the world a beautiful, vivid image of Jesus through us. But if we shine too brightly ourselves, it competes with the image of Jesus and it obscures it. So God arranges for us to look a little less bright so that Jesus can be exalted through us. Listen to me, against the backdrop of our human weakness, the power of Christ working in and through us is sharply accentuated. People realize that what they're seeing and what they're hearing can't possibly be coming from us. It must be coming from God. Didn't Paul say God has hidden his treasure in jars of clay to show that the all-surpassing power comes from him? Beloved, how great is our God? He takes what Satan sends for our defeat and our destruction and he compels Satan to apply it for our good. 
How great is our God. He compels Satan to become his agent for our glory. He compels Satan to become his agent for our intimacy with Jesus. He compels Satan to become his agent for our usefulness to him. He compels Satan to become his agent for Jesus' glory through our weakness. How great is our God. He forces Satan to serve God's purposes and to subvert Satan's purposes. When I was a 10-year-old boy, when I was a little boy, uh, I used to play boxing with my older cousin. He was 10 years older than me. He'd get down on his knees and we'd have a little play boxing match. And I would throw a punch at him and he would grab my wrists and he would overpower me. And he would turn my wrist and he would make me punch myself. <laughs> make me punch myself in the face. And it's just playing. He wasn't, he wasn't mean. He was, he was gentle with me. But you know, that's exactly what Jesus does. Satan throws punches at our heads, but Jesus overpowers him. And he turns the force of his blows to work against him. Oh, we still feel the blows, but they hurt him. They don't hurt us. Three truths about God in 2 Corinthians 12. He initiates personal encounters. He knows best and he's in complete control. That was courses one through seven. You ready for dessert? All right, here's the final truth. Pastor Nick, come and help me if you would. God tabernacles with us when we delight in him. Beloved, listen to me. For Paul, there was something that mattered more than being comfortable. And that was intimacy with Jesus. Usefulness to God mattered more to Paul than being pain-free. Jesus' glory mattered more to Paul than being problem-free. Paul didn't enjoy suffering. He prayed for Jesus to remove it, but he was willing to endure suffering if it meant experiencing more of Jesus in his life and in his ministry. Paul says, for Christ's sake, I delight in weaknesses. That word delight, it doesn't mean what it means to us. It doesn't mean enjoy. That word delight, it means I'm willing to accept it. I'll consider it good for me. I don't enjoy it, but I'll consider it good and I'll accept it. Do you know that's precisely the kind of person that God likes to dwell with? That's precisely the kind of person that God's presence remains with. Paul says, I will boast all the more gladly about my weaknesses so that the power of Christ might rest on me. That's a special word, rest on me. It means that he might pitch his tent with me. It means that he might tabernacle with me. In the wilderness, Jesus tabernacled. He pitched his tent with the children of Israel. In their weakness... In their vulnerability, a million freed slaves out in the open wilderness with no walls to protect them, with no military experience, in their vulnerability, in their weakness, Jesus pitched his tent among them. He tabernacled among them in power, in a column of fire and in a cloud that covered them. And when we delight in his presence, more than our own comfort and ease. Jesus pitches his tent. He tabernacles with us in power and we experience what it means to be supernaturally sustained by him in the midst of our weaknesses and our vulnerability. I was given a thorn in my flesh a messenger of Satan to punch me in the head. Three times I pleaded with Jesus to take it away from me. But he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you. For my power is made perfect in your weakness. God never promised that we'd always be comfortable. But he did promise that we would always be comforted. What's your thorn today? Are you sick? His grace is enough. 
Are you in pain? His grace is enough. Are you weak? His grace is enough. Are you afraid? His grace is enough. Are you grieving? His grace is enough. Are you lonely? His grace is enough. Are you tempted? His grace is enough. Are you being harassed? His grace is enough. I want to close today with the words of one of the greatest preachers of modern times, Charles Spurgeon. 150 years ago, he pastored a mega church before mega churches were heard of. Charles Spurgeon suffered from a lifetime of depression, sickness. He and his wife, he was heavily criticized by his peers. On April 2nd, 1876, he preached a sermon from 2 Corinthians 12, and I find that his words still preach to me today. It is easy to believe in grace for the past and for the future, but to rest in grace for the immediate need, now that is true faith. At this moment, at all moments, which shall ever occur between now and glory, the grace of God will be sufficient for you. This sufficiency is declared without any limitations, and therefore I understand this passage to mean that the grace of our Lord Jesus is sufficient to uphold thee. Sufficient to strengthen thee, sufficient to comfort thee, sufficient to make thy trouble useful to thee, sufficient to enable thee to triumph over it, sufficient to bring thee out of 10,000 more like it, sufficient to bring thee home to heaven. Whatever would be good for thee, Christ's grace is sufficient to bestow. Whatever would harm thee, his grace is sufficient to avert. Whatever thou desirest, his grace is sufficient to give thee, if it be good for thee. Whatever thou wouldst avoid, his grace can shield thee from it, if his wisdom shall so dictate. Let me press on you the pleasing duty of taking this promise personally at this moment. For no believer here need live under any fear, since for him also, at this very instance, the grace of our Lord Jesus is sufficient. Would you stand and give Jesus, the King of kings and the Lord of lords, a great big praise in this place today? Oh, come on, let's not...